Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is repeating his commitment to additional military spending, but he also appears this morning to be balking at the notion of doubling that spending in response to new pressure from Donald Trump. Trudeau is just wrapping up a news conference at the end of the NATO Leaders Summit in Brussels. You heard it live on CBC News Network. Let's listen in to some of what the Prime Minister just said. It was a, a very strong, a very positive meeting where we reinforced the importance of NATO, reinforced the unity of NATO, and reinforced the commitment we have made, certainly encouraged uh, strongly by the President over the past year uh, to uh, continue to invest strongly and continue to increase our investments uh, in our defence capacities and oh. our capabilities. There you go. Now, just by way of setting up this next clip and, and understanding that what the pro what the president of the United States said earlier this morning is that all of the NATO members have agreed to at very uh, increased speed get up to their commitments to 2% of GDP on defense spending by 2024 or sooner and then look at perhaps even increasing to 4%. So Canada right now at 1.23% of GDP on defense, but Canada last year announcing a new liberal defense policy and budget increasing the defense budget by 70 percent over the next decade to 32.7 billion dollars and what you heard from the prime minister today over and over again is that is Canada's commitment stated before no additional money is committed in the response to Donald Trump's push today and this is our own Catherine Cullen as she attempted to get him to clarify and to be specific about whether any new promises were made you were very clear in Latvia the other day you said no Canada will not be doubling its defence budget in response to a question about 2024. Is that still true today? Yes, we are increasing by 70% over the next decade our defence investments. But not doubling the budget, and yet Donald Trump is saying... 70 is not doubling, yeah. no. It's, yeah, uh, yet Donald Trump <laughs> is saying, as you're aware, that all of the allies, NATO allies, and he was asked specifically about Canada today, are going to reach 2%. How do you explain the fact that he seems to think you've committed to this? We have recommitted to our Wales engagements. Uh, the Wales uh, commitment to reverse the decline in spending and uh, increase our spending towards 2%. That's exactly what we are doing. So there, the Prime Minister, as he answered Catherine Cullen's question, let's go right to Catherine herself. She's on the phone now from, uh, from Brussels and from that briefing room. Catherine, it, it was really interesting to try, uh, you tried, uh, everyone in that room <laughs> tried to get an exact clarification whether Canada has committed to anything new. But I think the headline is it, it, it didn't sound like that. Right, and I would say there are two interesting things, Heather. Um, uh, what I took away from that is no, Canada's plan hasn't changed since two days ago. We are going to continue, as the Prime Minister said repeatedly, to double, uh, to rather to increase the, the defence budget by 70% over a 10-year horizon, not, though, reaching that 2% goal by 2024, which was that 2014 commitment. So that's a lot of numbers, but let's talk about, I think, even more interestingly, the Prime Minister's approach to everything this morning. He, um, it did seem that he was obfuscating, that he did not want to clearly contradict Donald Trump on the record. Uh, this is a very tense time between Canada and the United States right now. Trump made a very public declaration. So I was quite struck by the fact that the Prime Minister um, only seemed to be willing to express Canada's intentions in very particular ways. We are committed to that set of goals. I think by the end of that news conference, we understood that uh, Canada is still signing on <laughs> to the goals from a few years ago as a good principle, and yet will not meet those goals. Justin Trudeau's message hasn't changed. It certainly hasn't changed throughout the course of this trip, uh, perhaps even before. And yet Donald Trump is saying he, he personally is responsible for this massive change that's happened in the last 24 hours. So there was a contradiction there of the U.S. president, but it was done in a way as uh, perhaps so not to provoke, because you will recall, of course, that the last time that these two men met, um, Donald Trump did feel mm -hmm. provoked when he left the G7 meeting in the shell of why he tweeted some not so nice things about uh, Canada's Prime Minister calling him very dishonest and weak. Um, and, and so I think Justin Trudeau was choosing his words carefully today, but it certainly did lead to some 
confusion about what it is exactly that Canada intends to do. It was interesting, going back to the Liberal Defence Plan, yes, you're right, I mean, hitting that new $32.7 billion spending increase, that takes it up to 2027, so not the time frame, but working in that direction, emphasizing Canada's putting all of that money into new personnel and new equipment purchases, the warships and the fighter jets, etc. Um, but it was also interesting to hear him reiterate the message you frequently hear from uh, from Canada's government about Canada punching above its weight and re-emphasizing <laughs> the new leadership roles in Latvia and in Iraq just announced in recent days. That's not spending, but that is still a, a re restatement of Canada's commitment to NATO. And he, he made an interesting point at the end of the news conference when he said, what you spend on your military budget doesn't necessarily lead to additional capacity for NATO missions. So what Justin Trudeau is doing um, in a sort of understated way is calling into question Donald Trump's whole reasoning on this. I mean, why is Donald Trump asking other countries to spend more? The idea is, as he has stated it, that the U.S. is taking on too much. So presumably other countries spend more on their militaries and the U.S. can in some manner scale back its NATO contributions. The prime minister saying, listen, 2% of GDP, although perhaps he didn't say it quite so bluntly, 2% um, of GDP doesn't necessarily guarantee you a particular outcome for NATO. And of course, that suits uh, his kind of argument in all of this as well, which uh, essentially is quality over quantity. Don't focus on the numbers. Focus on the nature of our contributions uh, and highlighting the fact that Canada has taken on these new leadership roles, even though it doesn't really mean a lot of additional spending. Okay. Uh, just before I let you go, Catherine, let's just switch to another topic. He was asked on a couple of occasions, well, about the meeting on the margins with Donald Trump, uh, and he gave a little bit of insight into what they talked about. It didn't sound like any tariffs on automobiles very specifically. Very there. little yeah. new information, just about trade in general. Was there any new detail that you picked up? The, the point you just made about auto tariffs, I think, was the most significant thing, that it didn't come up. Um, but the kinds of information that he was putting forward, sort of general comments that it was a good but brief meeting are, are details that have come out uh, already. And the fact that they talked about NAFTA. Now, certainly that is a topic we would expect them to discuss. It's not clear, though, whether any progress was made over the course of that discussion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the last time they uh, butted heads over the question of trade, it led to... Donald Trump taking out some insults of the prime minister. So perhaps just having a conversation that uh, goes smoothly <laughs> counts for something. But it's not evident that there was any particular progress that came out of that meeting. Or certainly if there was not anything that uh, the prime minister's office is interested in talking about. And you have to think, given the pressure they're facing on this file, that, uh, that, that they would be happy to signal some sort of progress, a win, if there was indeed one. Okay. Catherine, listen, thank you for this and for all morning. Your coverage there, most helpful in uh, putting this together, this uh, quite a surprising turn in the story of the NATO summit, and Catherine Cullen following the prime minister and covering that summit for us. That is Canada's prime minister's side of the story, but Donald Trump, as we've been reporting to you this morning, saying something very different, boasting that he himself personally is making NATO better, stronger, and more united. Now, that followed an extraordinary few hours on this final day of the NATO Leader Summit. So let's bring in Lindsay Duncombe, who's in Washington, with more on this big win that Trump is claiming for himself at the NATO summit, that he alone has uh, propelled this toward new record funding levels, Lindsay. It's very interesting to look at the rhetoric from Donald Trump and then compare it with what other leaders are saying, including Justin Trudeau and the Secretary General, who said that the president had created a new sense of urgency with his presence at the summit. But really, we don't have any specifics about what Donald Trump said happened, which is that he got a commitment for faster funding for defense budgets from NATO. The context to this is that Donald Trump Trump blew into Brussels. He went off in a breakfast diplomatic photo op, went after Germany for its pipeline with Russia, then showed up late after tweeting about NATO uh, not contributing enough to defense. Over all of this was the threat that the U.S. military commitment to the alliance could be reduced, potentially even that the United States might back out of NATO. And Donald Trump showed up late this morning. There was an emergency session about budgets. And then he walked out saying that he had 
fixed the problem. Here's Donald Trump. Me, I guess in this case, total credit, because I said it was unfair. Now, what has happened is presidents over many years, from Ronald Reagan to Barack Obama, they came in, they said, okay, hey, do the best you can, and they left. Nobody did anything about it. Everybody in that room, by the time we left, got along, and they agreed to pay more, and they agreed to pay it more quickly. Let's look at what they actually agreed to in the declaration from yesterday. They agreed to do what they were already doing, which we saw from the Prime Minister of Canada uh, giving support to that idea of 2%. There may be more urgency to that, but there doesn't appear to be a new plan based on what unfolded this morning at NATO. The United States did sign on to that declaration. And what's interesting about that is how strong the language in this declaration is against Russia. The aggressive actions, including the threat of the use of force for political goals are all things NATO has identified as a concern in the United States after weeks of diplomatic behind the scenes preparation for this summit that wasn't necessarily the president's involvement has signed on to that as well. On Russia, uh, a question, because it was interesting, Justin Trudeau at his news briefing asked about it, Lindsay, and he said it was absolutely clear, it was very clear, was his phrasing, uh, that NATO together strong and united on the question of Russia and on any uh, question of external influence, we will not accept it. So how is the NATO outcome and seeming resolution on this, how is that going to affect what's coming up on Monday when Trump does sit down with Vladimir Putin? On paper, from the bureaucratic perspective, with the officials at the United States who are concerned about the election meddling, who are concerned about Crimea, it would appear as though all these countries are on the same page. But Donald Trump and his relationship with Vladimir Putin is the wild card here, especially when you consider that the two leaders are going to be meeting one-on-one, -on -one, and Donald Trump's language continues to be warmer to the Russian president than it is to his NATO allies. There was more evidence of that at the news conference this morning. Here's what it sounded like. Ultimately, he's a competitor. He's representing Russia. I'm representing the United States. So, in a sense, we're competitors. Not a question of friend or enemy. He's not my enemy. And hopefully someday, maybe he'll be a friend. It could happen. But I, don't, I just don't know him very well. I've met him a couple of times. And when I did meet him, most of you people were there. And here are some specifics that NATO allies will be looking for coming out of that summit. One is, will the United States' Donald Trump move to support Russia in its annexation of Crimea, to accept that as just the way it is? Certainly not the position of NATO. Trump was asked about that, and he did what he's done before, and that is blame Barack Obama for the problem in the first place and then dodge the question about whether or not he would uh, support Russia, which certainly any other leader of a NATO country would say, no way. And the other point is he didn't answer directly a question about the possibility of reducing military exercises in the Baltics. So while the language of the declaration and all of the work that the people who work behind the scenes in this country and others seems to be pointing to a strong message, a coordinated message for Russia that Justin Trudeau talked about, Donald Trump is the wild card. Lindsay, thank you very much. There's Lindsay in Washington.